everyone. Let's get into this. Let's not have an audio loop, please. All right. Hello. I know that's really annoying. Okay. Oh. <clears throat> now Bluetooth is doing something funny. So, and if we go back to the string, just didn't want to. Yep, yep, test, test, test. All right. <coughs> so, this is where we ended up. At the end of last uh, lecture, better. Um, all right, so <clears throat> looking at short exact sequences, is this echoing for anyone else? Is it just test, test? No, okay, that seems all right. Um, yeah, so we're looking at ways in which um, short exact sequences are ways that we can compute things. So uh, I'm just quickly looking something up. Uh, duh, 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 duh. I want. Come on. Nope. Nope. All right. There's a thing I was looking for, and I don't know where it is. So that's fine. Okay, it stopped. Yeah, just at the very start, um, I had the external speakers for the computer being the monitor for the audio <clears throat> and so it was just echoing through the microphone all right <clears throat> so yeah so I thought I should maybe make a quick remark about this last little bit here uh, so what does it mean that we know a and c and want b so it might be that we have something like um, Z plus Z mod N to B to Z mod K, for instance, something like this, say squared. And then, so we know what the groups are on the outside and we don't know what B is. So B is the thing we wanted to calculate, but we have a theorem or some other construction that tells us that it fits into a short exact sequence like this. And then depending on what K and N are, and maybe sort of thinking a bit about what the, <clears throat> what the maps are, we can actually calculate what B is. So maybe N and K are a bit bit too general. Let me do something like this. Um, oops, no, that's not what I want. Yeah, so I'm just making stuff up here. It's, it's not going to work out necessarily. Um, uh, I will change this K make this a, a, a three say <clears throat> all right so this this is injective and this is onto so it tells us that um, B has at least two generators for instance
So B is an abelian group. And these generators are outside image. Because everything in that image is in the it's that's precisely the kernel of the map down to Z mod three squared. Ah, uh, space kitter, it's um it was an exhaust break. The uh Yeah, so we can tell things about B knowing this is a short exact sequence. And so um, I don't think this uniquely specifies B, but it puts strong restrictions on what B can be. So I think B has to have a direct sum and of Z mod 2. Uh, no. No, I mean, no, I won't. So, I mean, for example, B could be a direct sum of the outside two things, the direct sum of Z plus Z mod 2 and Z mod 3 squared, or it could be something more complicated. So, so it might be this. Or, or uh, it could be Z plus Z mod 6, for instance. So B is not uniquely specified, but if we know some more about the situation, like for instance, if, if we knew we had a section, so it's a map this way, such that the round trip Z mod 3 squared to B back down is the identity, if we know we have that, we know we're in this in this case. But if we're not, uh, semi direct product, um, uh, everything's abelian, so there it's. Um, so for modules it's different like Tommy if you have uh, arbitrary groups this is true but when you look at what um, a semi-direct product looks like um, yeah the way the action works is my conjugation so yeah so you should really think of these not as groups but as Z modules so everything is z-linear, and so it acts more like linear things rather than um, <clears throat> arbitrary groups. And there are other options, right, because we could have uh, z plus z mod. So in this case, the map from z to z is the times by 3 map. And in this case, it's a mixture, so we could have that plus Z mod 6. Or, or, but it, it massively cuts down the possible options. And um, don't quote me, but these are probably most of what's going on. Right, so we've really sort of constrained ourselves by knowing that B fits into an exact sequence like this. All right, so that's just what I wanted to say um, about that. Okay, so going back to delta sets just a little bit. And so we have a delta set. So if uh, x is no, I want to say this. So we defined its cohomology modules last time. So 
So we took a delta set and then we formed a cochain complex by looking at functions from the sets of simplices to our given ring and then turn that into a cochain complex and we can take the cohomology of this cochain complex and that is by definition the cohomology of x so if only finitely many of those are non-zero and they're all finite dimension uh, not R say Q and they're all finite dimensional vector spaces we can define its Euler characteristic we might think of this as the cohomological Euler characteristic Uh, it's going to be chi of x. That's lovely. Chi of x is the alternating sum All right, So this sum is actually finite, but it, I'm not going to specify what it goes up to because eventually it stops. So, so the sort of ordinary Euler characteristic I even call this like chi co for cohomological so given a finite delta set so one where there's finitely many uh, simplices overall so only finitely many um, so it's got to be finite dimensional so this is n dimensional or some n and then in each dimension on each like there are only finitely many k simplices for every k less than or equal to n where this is Uh, so it's n dimensional so we know we can sum up to only n so the number of counting the number of i simplices so a nice exercise standard exercise is that for x finite these agree so we saw the example of a uh, a directed graph and if I took um, x to be a combinatorial surface then uh, this this definition gives the Euler characteristic, you know, like Euler, you know, like a tetrahedron or something, really classical object. So these are the same. So it's a matter of counting dimensions, breaking sort of the rank um, nullity theorem, all this type of stuff. So. Um, so this generalizes the Euler characteristic to things which aren't necessarily finite um, or even finite dimensional in principle you can have an infinite dimensional thing but where the, the cohomology modules these rational vector spaces vanish above a certain dimension so it doesn't help us if the cohomology is infinite dimensional 
or if there are infinitely many non-trivial cohomology modules. So it's not a free-for-all, but it's, it's kind of nice. And in particular, it's somehow moving beyond, like we need this particular triangulation of a space to define Euler characteristic. It's now a measure of something deeper. It's only looking at cohomology. So I haven't proved that cohomology is invariant under various things yet. Um, in particular, we're not even looking at spaces yet, but when we get there, um, it'll be nice. Okay, so here's a definition. Another source of delta sets. And the one we ultimately really care about. So we've been talking about these abstract sort of triangles and tetrahedra and so on, just combinatorial things. But we can actually define a topological a topological simplex. Uh, equals one. So what does this look like? Uh, let's take well n equals zero. Well, that's just this point. Kind of boring. N equals one. Okay, so we're in R two. So we're in the positive quadrant, and we look at this line segment. So it's the part of the, the subspace, the affine subspace, defined by v0 plus v1 equals 1. Uh, n equals 2, the last one I'll draw. Should do these in a slightly different. Okay, so um, <clears throat> it's this triangle, it's not really to scale, so 0, V1, V2. Okay, so N equals 3 is a solid tetrahedron inside R4, which I'm not going to draw. Okay, so along with this, these are objects So the maps sort of partial i that include the n minus one dimensional simplex into the n dimensional simplex, and what it does it inserts zero in the ith position. So, uh, for instance, partial zero. Um, <clears throat> let me do it for n equals two, for instance. So we should have uh, v zero and v one. V zero, v zero, v one. Two sends it to uh, v zero v one. Uh, it's not a v. That's a zero. All right, and so this includes uh, the the one topological one simplex here, delta one, as the three edge segments of delta two. 
here, here, and here. So again, we start counting from zero. And there, are, so there's n plus one slots in uh, the codomain here. Right? So delta n sits in Rn plus one. So there's n plus one slots counting from zero up to n. And these are the, here, there's the three slots. Okay. So I am. Um, So here's another definition. This requires knowing what a metric space is, not in any deep way, but just saying, well, it's a some type of space, you know, a sub fancy subset of Rn, say. So given a metric or even a topological space, but I haven't defined those yet. Uh, the singular delta set uh, S M so it's K simplices is a set of continuous maps from the topological K simplex into M Bluetooth finally decided to. Wow, weird. <clears throat> okay, so that's uh, that's the sets of K simplices. We have to define the face maps, and we do those. Uh, we define those using the the um, these maps partial I. So let's get rid of that. So I assume sigma goes from delta uh, k into m, and this function goes from delta k minus 1. Sorry, that's k minus 1. This is k. Or if you like, maybe you we'll go put a plus one here and scrub that. Um, what's the video quality like, just out of curiosity? Better than normal? Oh, that's good. Okay. Um, ba, 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 ba. All right. <clears throat> so we actually need to prove that this defines a, a, a delta set. So, um, proof uses this following identity. So we've got delta j, sorry, not delta, partial j, partial i. It's partial i composed partial j minus 1. Where this is a map from delta n minus 1 to delta n plus 1. And this holds uh, for all in i and j in this range. 
<clears throat> so you can check this identity um, explicitly by just counting positions um, poking a zero in and everything shifts up and then poke another zero in and everything shifts up and the order in which you do those um, doesn't matter as long as i and j are related by this inequality all right so this is a really big delta set this is not like let's draw a surface and it's finitely triangulated if i took <coughs> like a torus everyone's favorite surface and then did this uh each smk is like uncountably um, it's just uncountable it's huge and it gets worse to some extent so from this we get uh, a cochain complex uh let's see so c bullet of m with coefficients in r so we define it to be the um, the cochain complex associated to the delta set S M and then uh, from this we get a well at this point let's stop right so <coughs> let's just pause this as an aside C N M R is a set of all functions to R from continuous functions from delta N to M. So now we've got functions um, like some uncountable base of functions between, you know, let's say M the torus for instance, like functions from a simplex into a torus and then we've got functions out of this function space into R and so like this is uncountably infinitely dimensional and it's not even like the free module on this uncountable set it's functions out of this thing so it's like even bigger again it's like 2 to the 2 to the to the a of zero or something right it's it's big so we ain't writing down matrices at this point um yeah so chris mentions singular easier for proofs and combinatorial for be better for commendations computations um yeah definitely the combinatorial stuff is where the computations happen like really super explicit computations um, and then uh, the singular stuff is better for functoriality so I should just mention that s all right what well, it's a functor from let's say a category of metric spaces and continuous maps to delta sets so it ten sends a continuous function to the function uh, s m1 to s m2. What does this function do? It takes uh, delta k going to m1 in dimension k and sends it to the composite with f. And this is respects all the various structure around. So when you look at like, does this map preserve the face maps for these delta sets? It does because face maps are induced by precomposing with these partial I maps. So this is a functor. In particular, 
we're allowed arbitrary continuous functions where when you have triangulations the only maps which make sense are very rigid they preserve triangles they preserve simplices so if you said oh, i'm going to triangulate this space and triangulate this space then almost never will a continuous map between them that you're interested in respect all the, the edges and triangles and tetrahedra and so on and in particular um, delta sets uh, are like their maps are especially rigid so that's that's a nice aside anyway and from the code chain complex Uh, so we get cohomology. So here's the definition. Let's just say a metric or topological space M is well hk mr is the case cohomology of this cochain complex and this is this is the thing that is like what we ultimately want to calculate mostly because it's the best for um, functoriality and so on any questions so far I should say in particular uh, all our methods so far are no good for calculating these because it's not even clear that the cohomology is going to be finite dimensional it's just some quotient module where you're starting with horrible infinite dimensional modules so we need better ways to calculate it. So maybe one thing in the favor of singular cohomology is it doesn't rely on a triangulation of the, the space that you're interested in it somehow allows for all possible triangulations at once like we're not picking the specific embeddings of like triangles into our surface that fit together to form a triangulation what we're doing is just throwing triangles at it in all possible ways no matter how they sit in there and then let's use those Okay, so this brings us to the second section of our course. All right, so just going to quickly so we've seen short exact sequences. Just write it down again. Um, and so I've just been discussing short exact sequences as a sort of an atomic concept, but we can break it down <clears throat> into something a little bit more granular. Um, So, so given an arbitrary sequence uh, 
So these superscripts here are just indices. So it is said to be exact at a particular module, a n here, if <coughs> the image of fn minus 1 is the kernel of fn. All right, so this is different from being short exact because I'm, all I'm saying is it's exact at this one module and the sequence can be arbitrarily long. So if then uh, we might say it's a long exact sequence if it's exact at a n for every n. So this means that the image of every map is precisely equal to the kernel of the following map for every map in the sequence. So I think Maybe it was Chris who was itching to get to this idea, I can't remember. <clears throat> so, let's see some examples. Uh, well, every short exact sequence is an example. Um, So let's extend that by zero everywhere and this is uh, exact precisely when f is an isomorphism this is the best situation to get into and often you get this get to this point you happen to know what one of A or B are exactly, like it's the integers or something, and you don't know what the other one is. And you know, oh, the sequence is exact, so the other one is integers as well. Um, so, so that's exact outright. Uh, this is exact at a if f is injective uh, and the other way round this is exact at b f is subjective And these put together to give me example two. Um, let's say I have an exact sequence then uh, what, what can I do? I can throw away everything before B and then quotient B by the image of A under F and then continue as before this is the same thing also as B mod kernel of G. So we're basically sort of stopping the exact sequence at one point, throwing everything before it, and 
messing with the first entry so that it stays exact. So no matter what the first sequence was, it could have had lots of stuff uh, left of the A out here, but I'm just killing it all. Um, and you can do a similar one where you might say, uh, let's take the image of G. H is unmodified, yes. Uh, space Kidder. And uh, this map uh, before H is defined to be the map induced by G. So if you pick a representative inside B for something in the quotient module, then apply G to it, then it's precisely what this map is. So yes, yeah, so similarly you get um, A, B, And this is uh, G and F. So sometimes this is useful because you've got an exact sequence and you're interested in a specific thing uh, and you can kind of go, well, everything before this point I kind of know or know far enough so I can collapse down that information. So I might know like A and B uh, and D and I'd like to know C so I can then truncate it so that I get B mod F of A, which I know because I know A and B, and I know D, and so now I know both things on either side of C. And C has, right, this is exact, so this here is injective. So in particular, if B mod F of A is uh, non-trivial, you know that C is non-trivial. So you can build up partial information like this. So here's our aim, our overall aim at this level of algebraic topology, is we want to get exact sequences. Because then you can use partial information about some of the cohomologies that appear in some of the positions to calculate other cohomologies. Okay, um, yeah, so like after this, there's a technique called spectral sequences, which is much more complicated, um, of which this is kind of turns up maybe as a as a byproduct of a special case of that but it's quite fearsome so we're not going to cover that in this course but that's but once you're at that level like you're just calculating cohomology like a pro um <clears throat> so chris yes there is such a thing as relative cohomology and we're going to get to that and in fact what i'm about to say now is kind of the the little warm-up um But what we do have, though, instead of exact sequences of cohomology modules, wind your mind back, what we do is have we have things like short exact sequences of cochain complexes. Like if we have a push out of delta sets, then we get a short exact sequence, I mean a push out of delta sets where we're like taking two sub delta sets and uh, looking at their intersection and how they union together to form the big delta set. Yeah, so Chris, this is a thing that happens. We get a long exact sequence, but how, right? So let's sort of think about, it. we've got to work up to it. So here's a lemma. Uh, when we might not a priori have a, um, a short exact sequence of cochain complexes, but we can get one from less information. So let's say we fix a map of cochain complexes.
So a cochain complex, so a a short exact uh, sorry a long exact sequence is an ex oh, sorry maybe smaller side uh, a long is a cochain complex, but it's kind of a boring one in that instead of uh, yeah like it has no cohomology so that's not what we're looking for. The long exact sequence is there to calculate the individual items in it. So given a map of cochain complexes, uh, let's call it F. So recall this is a collection of maps from A n to B n. Then uh, all the kernels they assemble into a cochain complex. All the co kernels and we get uh, let's see cur f a to b to co curl of f. So, as a special case, if uh, each of the Fn's are injective, here's a short exact sequence chain complexes and we have the dual situation so each so if each of them is onto then we go the other way so we have kernel F and all of those together Okay, and so I should note um, I've got zeros here. What do they mean? That's a little bit tricksy. So zero. It's the all zero cochain complex. Any questions? Just uh, comments, complaints. There's possibly some fun stuff in off-topic in Discord, but I'm not going to go there. Try to keep this stream stable. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, good question, Chris. So why does it mean? So uh, we did a proof earlier that for a directed graph, we looked at the cochain complex for it, which was just two non-trivial items. So this is a slightly different calculation, but similar in spirit. You get a map, um, you had a map of cochain complexes and you looked at kernels and they, the kernel, the restriction of one map to a kernel mapped into the other kernel. So these are sort of similar things. So we have, let me draw these vertically. Um, <clears throat> so we have a, uh, say n minus one, p n minus one, a n. This is now sort of my my d n a is my d uh, n minus one b 
and this is f n minus one f n. So everything's modules, and if we look at the kernel here and the co-kernel. Uh, too many words, too many letters. And here, and the kernel here, then if I restrict uh, d a n minus 1, this is d a n minus 1 restricted to kernel of f n minus 1. So the restriction of this differential here factors through the the kernel sitting inside a n and so since this sub sub, -mod sub module sits inside they sit inside there <coughs> and uh, similarly if I pick something in the co-kernel of f n minus 1 then I I know this is onto I pick a representative up in bn minus 1, I apply the differential here, and then push down by this, look at its equivalence class in this co-kernel, then this gives me a well-defined function from this co-kernel to this co-kernel. So it's in some sense dbn minus 1, but only on representatives. But it turns out to be well defined. And these are both on two. And so if um, yeah. So for instance if Fn minus one is on two, all the Fn's are on two, the co kernel's trivial. And so then the right hand side will be zero. And likewise if the Fn's are all injective, then the very left hand side all the kernels are trivial. And so this gives us um, isomorphism theorems and so on it gives us short exact sequences at each uh, for each n as we work down yeah so mostly we're going to think about uh, sort of the left hand side of this but um, sort of yeah there's sort of conceptual reasons to think about if I have a co-chain complex and then somehow all these sub modules then you build the co-kernel in a nice way, but um, cool. And my my clock is on my computer. Appears to have stopped. Yes, it stopped an hour ago. Weird. <laughs> All right, lucky I wasn't relying on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I look at my watch, and that's fine. And I look at the the. It still says. 11.57, uh, which is SA time. So that was when I uh, tried doing something on my computer that killed the um, the panel that has all the little gizmos up there. All right. Awesome. So yeah, so now what we're going to go from now, I don't have a white T-shirt, Tyson. Um, <coughs> bordering on uh, inappropriate comments there um, now it's more the fact my computer's seven years old and it wasn't it was like the bottom of the range when I bought it then usually pretty good all right yeah so from here on in we're gonna build up um, all the technology we need to get to ultimately what's called the Maya Via Torah sequence which is the thing which allows us to calculate cohomology um, in a large number of cases and various like technical helper lemmas which we'll rely on um, in order to um, do this all right um, so in the absence of any Further live discussion, we can move over to Discord if you want to have a bit of a chat there.
Cool. Catch you all soon. Um, we got a shoot tomorrow. And uh, look forward to it. Catch you later.